I have three panels here. The first one is just to illustrate the mechanics of a fixed for fixed currency swap. Then after I illustrate the mechanics, I'd like to show you how we price or value this currency swap as if it were two bonds. That's probably the more intuitive way. And then the third way is to illustrate how John Hull shows it in his latest book, which is valuing this currency swap as if it were a series of forward rate agreements. I'd start by illustrating the mechanics of a fixed for fixed currency swap before I show you how to price or value that swap. We first want to understand how it works. And the fixed for fixed currency swap is not the only, there are many variations of the currency swap, but the fixed for fixed is probably the most basic and common because it's an exchange of a fixed interest rate for another fixed interest rate as opposed to neither of them are floating each year according to some index. So we do need four assumptions just even to illustrate the mechanics of a fixed for fixed currency swap. But first, I'll assume that we are, for lack of a better phrase, the financial institutions. We imagine ourselves to be in the shoes of the financial institution. This fixed for fixed currency swap, because I'm following John Hole's example in his chapter seven, happens to be a swap of US dollars and Japanese yen. So we as the financial institution are going to be paying US dollars to the counterparty, which I'll just denote with a C for counterparty, very generic. We're paying US dollars and we are receiving Japanese yen. So that means our counterparty is paying Japanese yen and receiving US dollars. So the four assumptions we need are here. We first need a principal amount. And you may recall in the plain vanilla interest rate swap, we referred to this as a notional. The plain vanilla interest rate swap is a swap of fixed for floating interest rates, the most common swap of all. We called it a notional because in that swap, there was no exchange of the notional. Similarly, we have a good reason for calling this a principal here as opposed to a notional because in the currency swap, we're exchanging different currency. There will be an exchange of this principal. So, so it could be called a notional, but it's better to call it a principal to remember a key difference here between the currency swap and a plain old plain vanilla interest rate swap that doesn't exchange this. This principal amounts will be exchanged at the end and probably at the beginning as well. So the principal amounts here are in dollars. These are in millions, 10 million US dollars. And on the Japanese yen side, 1,200 million Japanese yen are the two principal amounts. We also need the respective swap weights following John Hull, 4% on the US dollar side and 3% on the Japanese yen side. That is per annum as usual. We don't need the interest rate in exchange until we go to price or value this. We have enough here just to illustrate the mechanics of this currency swap that we might start here at time zero. I'll skip these for just a moment. And again, we're paying, we were swapping at the end of each year in this case, not every six months. Some swaps do that. In the currency swap here, we're going to do at the end of once per year at the end of the year. So at the end of the first year, the pay dollar amount is 4% multiplied by the principal or 4% of the 10 million US dollar principles. So we're from the perspective of the financial institution that's paying US dollars. So I do have, have that as a negative to represent an outflow. So at the end of year, our, our payment will be 0.4 million or 400,000 US dollars. Notice the uh, currency symbol is uh, notation is deliberate here and we will be receiving what our counterparty is paying and our counterparty is paying 3% on the 1,200 million yen or 36 million yen. That's the fixed first fixed exchange at the fixed interest rates. So it's actually knowable here at inception of the swap. And you can see the mechanics are really straightforward because nothing's floating. At the end of each year, we are paying 400,000 US dollars and we are receiving 36 million Japanese yen. And then we get to the end and we notice that key difference with the currency swap from the plain vanilla interest rate swap. The 
principal amount is getting included. So at the end, and I have a TX to mean, this could mean at the end of T5, at the end of five years, seven years, three years, whatever. At the end of the, the final cash flow here is going to be a payment of not only that 400000 of the interest, but also the $10 million principal. So we're paying $10.4 million, and we are receiving $1,236 million Japanese yen, which is that $36 million interest, plus the $1,200 in principal. Okay, so far so good. The only final issue about that is that because this principal is being exchanged at the end in this swap, it would be very lopsided or top heavy if it wasn't also exchanged at the beginning. And so at the beginning, we have an exchange just of the principal. That's at time zero. And it goes the other way. So notice, we as the financial institution, we are generally paying US dollars, including paying the 10 million US dollars at the end. That means we start the swap by receiving 10 million US dollars from our counterparty, and we start the swap by paying 1,200 million Japanese yen to our counterparty, which at the end of the swap will come back to us, right? So at the beginning, the, the, the initial cash flows are actually the, uh, is the only instance here of where these are reversed. We start by here, we are gonna receive the US dollar principal amount and we are going to pay the Japanese yen principal amount at time zero. Okay, so at time zero, we don't need to price or value the swap because this value at swap inception, like most derivative contracts, is going to be zero. We only value the swap at some point subsequent to inception when interest rates have actually changed from our initial assumptions. So I start by perhaps the more intuitive way, I think, to value this currency swap. It's not the one that Hull shows us in the 10th edition. He shows us the next one. This more intuitive way, I think, is to value the uh, currency swap as if it were two bonds. So we have the same assumptions before, but we now need to incorporate, for purposes of pricing, both uh, interest rates and the uh, spot exchange rate. So the interest rate here are illustrated, and not only do we assume an interest rate to keep this simple, but we assume that the interest rate yield curve is flat. So John Hull's assumption for the U.S. interest rate is 2.5% per annum with continuous compounding, and his assumption for the Japanese interest rate is 1.5% per annum with continuous compounding, so the Japanese rate is lower. Also, the assumption here is that the swap has three years remaining life, or remaining tenor, if you like. We are, we are valuing the swap at some point after inception, and so we don't, necessarily, we don't necessarily need to know how far we into the swap, just that it has a remaining life of three years, and in this case, therefore, three more cash flows to value. We have the spot exchange rate, and they, this first one is a reciprocal of the second one, and this is a the currencies are US dollar and Japanese yen. The US dollar uh, ranks higher. So that means that typically by convention, this would be quoted with the US dollar as the base currency and the Japanese yen as the quote currency. And the assumption here, again, I'm still following Hall, is that there's 110 Japanese yen per one US dollar. And I looked it up, happens to be very close to where it is today by coincidence. So that's the spot exchange rate between the two currencies. And then we have the timeline here where we can value the swap as if it were two bonds. And if you're familiar with the bond pricing methodology, this is very straightforward because we've already covered how these are fixed rate coupon payments, 400,000 
400,000. And then for this swap with the remaining life of three years, we know that final cash flow, it's just like a bond, the principal's coming back as well, or we're paying the principal in this case 10.4. It's a stream of future cash flows. And all we need to do is translate the stream of future cash flows into a stream of present values. And you'll notice this is done in the usual way if the discount rate is with continuous compounding, we can use the convenience of the exponential function. So I won't cover that. It's a basic skill. The present value of those future values are given here. And the sum of those is 10.42 million, which is just like the theoretical price of a bond with this characteristics. So we, those US dollars we are paying, that leg of the swap is treated like a US dollar bond. Similarly, the Japanese yen has its coupon payments, 36 million, and then the principal plus that coupon. And those also, those future values also discounted at the, this time at the Japanese rate to give a stream of present value in Japanese yen term, which when summationed gives us what is really a, the theoretical price of a bond as if this segment of the bond that we are receiving were a Japanese yen bond. And in fact, we're receiving this yen. So this is very much as if we were long a position in a Japanese yen, a Japanese yen bond. And so it has this current theoretical price in Japanese yen. So notice up to this point, We've treated these, we've done the same thing on both sides of treating the swap as if it were two bonds. The only thing is we have a pr current price in Japanese yen that we simply can divide here by the spot exchange rate. We're dealing in present value terms. We can use a spot exchange rate of 110 and it gives us a theoretical price in US dollar terms such that we are paying this lower amount and receiving this higher amount. The difference is the net present value of this currency swap in, mil in uh, happens to be just shy of 1 million or about 963,000. I think Hull's example is 962,900. But if we took that out, we get the same exact uh, answer as in John Hull's example. Very straightforward. Okay, well, somewhat straightforward. Then final, final step is value in the currency swap as if it were a series of forward rate agreements. And the upper portion here is exactly the same. Also, that we pay in US dollars exactly the same. Paying in one year, 400,000, 400,000 US dollars, 10.4 million US dollars. We are the financial institution paying this amount. From a future value perspective, we will be receiving 36 million yen, 36 million yen, 1,236 million yen. So far, mirrors exactly the mechanics of this currency swap. So here's the only difference. Now, this step, again, following John Hull, we extract the implied forward rates actually forward, foreign exchange forward rates from the flat interest rate curves, right? This US and Japanese rate, these are flat yield curves for their respective interest rates. And we use interest rate parity here to extract the implied forward rates. And that interest rate parity is really an instance of the cost of carry model I've covered in a previous video as part of my uh, T3 playlist, but we're using here a cost of carry interest rate model, interest rate parity model, where the forward exchange rate uh, in US dollars is equal to, or could say the theoretical forward exchange rate is equal to the spot in US dollars multiplied by E raised to the risk-free interest rate in US dollars minus the risk-free rate in Japanese yen. And that difference multiplied by the maturity. In this case, the US rate is higher than the Japanese yen. So you see that's a positive value. 
And so the term structure of these forward foreign exchange rates is increasing above this amount. Now you'll know I did, you'll notice this is Hull's example actually. We switched from dealing here with uh, where U.S. dollar is the base currency over to here where Japanese yen is the base and it's quoted in U.S. dollars. So it's the same spot exchange rate here that's the basis for these forward foreign exchange rates but they are quoted here in US dollars, right? So we actually could have done it either way. They will match. But the point is we have extracted implied forward rates. Why would we do that? Because we are receiving these yen in the future and what will be the future value to us in US dollar terms, we don't know. We're using the forward foreign exchange rates to predict what their future value will be. These are the forward rates with our best estimate of what those future spot exchange, foreign exchange rates will be. And so we use those here, you can see in a simple multiplication. In two years, we will receive 36 million yen. The, for, the, 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 the predicted um, spot exchange rate we don't, we, well, we don't know what the spot exchange rate will be. We uh, anticipate it will be what the forward rate is today, the forward rate's predicting it. So we just multiply that. So, and then put another way, if the forward rate is a good predictor of that future spot exchange rate, then the 36 million in yen that we receive in two years will be worth at that time, you can see about 0.33 million US dollars or about 330 thousand US dollars. So that's the key difference there. We use the flat yield curves to extract implied forward rates. And then we use the implied forward rates to tell us that what the predicted value of these yen that we receive will be worth in US dollars when we receive them. So that's in that way, then we have a dollars to dollars comparison. And you can see it's just a difference here in terms of the net cash flow. If we go out to two years, we will be paying uh, 400,000 US dollars and we will be receiving an amount of yen that we predict will be worth 330,000 to us. And so our net cash flow in US dollars will be negative. So we have negative here, negative here, and we have a net cash flow in US dollars because we be able to do an apples to apples US dollars difference or subtraction gives us a net cash flow in US dollars, but future valued, which we then do the same, do we did before discount at the US rate to give us net cash flow, but in present value US dollar terms. And the sum of those is a theoretical price as of today, and it matches the price as if we did two bonds. So seems more tedious. This is the one that is shown, but there's a lot of logic here in terms of extracting the implied forward rates. So that's the approach under value in the currency, fixed for fixed currency swap as a series of forward rate agreements that matches treating the value, the currency swap as if it were two bonds. If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to the channel and you'll see my next one. Thank you.